Hey everyone, this is Dr. Casey Johnson. Thank you so much for taking time to listen to the Unlock Wellness Podcast. I know you're going to love today's episode with Heidi Germain Schnappoff. Heidi has an amazing story, so I'm excited to have her on to share it with you guys. If you've been loving the Unlock Wellness Podcast, if you haven't already, jump on iTunes, hit subscribe, and also leave a review. If you can hit the five-star button and write something that you love about the show, it really means a lot. And reviews help more people find the show as well, so it really means the world if you take time to do that. So thank you so much. Also, be sure to follow me on social media to keep up with the latest podcast episodes. The best way to connect with me is on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. My username across the board is at Dr. Casey Johnson. That's D-R-K-A-S-E-Y-J-O-H-N-S-O-N. You can also check out my website at drkcjohnson.com. It has all of the past podcast episodes and more information about each guest under the Listen tab. While you're on my site, also be sure to check out the Shop tab where you can check out my first book of my Healthy Children's Book series. Thank you again for listening. I hope this episode leaves you feeling inspired to start making positive changes to your health. Now it's time for today's episode. I hope you love my conversation with Heidi Germaine Schnappoff. Welcome to the Unlock Wellness Podcast. I'm Dr. Casey and excited for today's guest. I'm here with Heidi Schnappoff and Heidi is incredible. She's currently works in film and television as a stunt woman, stunt coordinator and actress. And she's worked on shows like NBC's Blind Spot, which I'm personally a big fan of. And Heidi has also recently completed directing her first time feature film, F Word, which she also co-wrote. But I'm very excited to have Heidi on to talk about her story and all of the amazing work that she's done. So Heidi, thank you so much again for taking time to come on. I'm excited to have you. Oh, goodness. It's my pleasure. Yeah. So for (laughs) quick. uh, So (laughs) Heidi and I, we've been trying to plan this out for a little bit and get this recorded. Um, It's kind of random, Heidi, because I found you. I know I've told you, but I found you through uh, Jen Bartell. She was a a past guest that, that came on. And uh, it's when she was, you know, recording for her show, American Woman, and she had a post about you and was bragging on you and your, and because you did her stunt work. And I remember when I saw that, I was like, that's a really cool job. Like, so I started following you and like started following all of the content you put out and random like workouts that you would share. And yeah, uh, yeah, so I was like, she's like really cool and obviously wanted to to get you on to chat. So I'm I'm glad that I found you uh, (laughs) through Jen. Dude, she's probably one of the coolest human beings I've ever met also, like in addition to being talented. And I heard her, her show on your, or her interview on your podcast too. And yeah, she's like, she's amazing. Awesome. Yeah. She's uh she's very cool. And you guys actually really do look a lot alike. Yeah. Oh yeah. It's probably one of the only actresses I've been able to be shot head on, you know, with like a little lighting, but yeah. Yeah. yeah I think the cool. one post that she posted with you, it was like the, um, the one episode in American Woman where like she jumps off the roof into the pool. Oh, yeah, that was fun. Here's here's your wardrobe. It's a bra and underwear, <laughs> by the way. <laughs> That's funny. So, I mean, your work is obviously really a different path and a really cool job. So, I mean, do you want to walk everybody uh, first where you're from, um, but also walk sure. us through how you got into stunt work to begin with? Because, I mean, like I was saying, it's just it's such a different path and very unconventional. Uh, sure. Yeah. Um, I'm from a small town in northeastern Pennsylvania, Kingston, Pennsylvania, near Wilkes-Barre. And I'm sure a lot of people know like Scranton, where the, the office is uh, <laughs> is, located, is set uh, very close to me. Um, but uh, yeah, I grew up in Pennsylvania and for the most part, moved to New York for school. And um, how did I get into stunt work? There's a really long story. There's a medium story. And I'm going to give you the Cliff Notes version, which is I, <laughs> I grew up doing martial arts. Um, my dad was very um, adamant about me, at least, you know, starting off in the martial arts and then kind of going and doing whatever sports I wanted after, but uh, to get like discipline and all that. And um, I took to it pretty quickly and I continued to do it through the rest of my life, actually. Um, sure. when my dad was a boxer. And um, so I always had that like physical and, and body awareness and spacing and timing and all that kind of stuff from a very, very, very young age, like talking like five years old or. Probably there are probably pictures of me with like 
huge boxing gloves on my hands when I was just a baby, you know. But um, so I had that kind of physical background growing up. And in high school, uh, I took to theater to kind of escape all my teenage angst and escape uh, all the things that teenagers don't want to think about. Their bodies are changing and they start getting anxiety about life and people. And theater was a really good way for me to, uh, you know, good outlet for me. And um, realized I wanted to, even when I was younger, I would play with all the boys in my neighborhood. Like they were just boys who play outside. And I would wrestle them and I'd fight them because, you know, the girls weren't really so much into the wrestling and fighting. <laughs> but um, we would, I would, unknowingly, I was pretty much making movies without a camera because we were pretty, I don't you want to use the term poor. We definitely didn't have any money. We didn't have like cameras or anything, but we would pretend I would make up these scenes and, and, um, looking back as I create a story and I'd be like, all right, then you're my brother and you come over here and I'm going to wrestle you down the hill and then we're going to, I'm going to punch you and then I'm going to win. And then or <laughs> we go into my house and we be fighting. And then I'm like, and then you push me down the stairs. I'm going to fall down the stairs. I'm going to get up and then you're going to run down the stairs and you're going to start punching me. And then I'm going to throw you over the couch. So I've basically had been doing stunts from the time I was, I don't know, seven or eight with my neighborhood boys. And then it went to, it's a fast forward to like high school. And I'm like, oh yeah, this is more of that pretending stuff that I love to do. And this acting is really cool because I can really delve into characters. And so, I mean, I did like over a hundred shows or plays or kids wow. shows throughout So acting high came supernatural? Um, it really, I just loved it. Yeah, it came, the whole scene came naturally to me. And I really, I really like telling people what to do. When I was younger, <laughs> and I really, I really like telling people like just to set the scene. And I, I was always a really, um, a big like, uh, advocate for collaborating with other people. So I ended up really liking getting into directing as well. I loved performing. I loved directing. And then realized eventually when I, I went to school, I went to NYU, I went to Wilkes University for a year I went to, and then transferred to NYU for acting at Tisch School of the Arts and studied with Lee Strasberg, um, studied with a, a lot of different schools out there in addition to uh, NYU I was in their conservatory program and met a lot of people in their film program and started, you know, doing acting things in their films and then kind of progressed to doing fights in their films and court, like I didn't even realize I was coordinating, but I was doing fight scenes and driving and growing up in Pennsylvania, you know, doing donuts in the parking lot and, you know, having uh, <laughs> snow days and taking your cars out. And I just was a big fan of all that. And uh, so, again, unknowingly, probably just doing stunts and not even realizing it when I was in, in college, even. Um, and then the acting thing, well, when you graduate, all right, got to get an agent, got to do all this stuff and started going on auditions. And the one thing I kept hearing over and over and over. And at the time, I mean, I'm about five, six, five, seven and probably weighed about 125 pounds out of college, 130 maybe. And um, casting directors were constantly saying like your face doesn't match your body like I, I was athletic I have an athletic body and my face looked like girl next door like really young and they were like you need to lose you need to lose like 10 20 pounds I'm like jeez that's I, I don't think that's healthy but I'll try and I just remember like going to the gym every day and like elliptical and then I went and got like a two dollar margarita after but that's <laughs> neither here because you burn the calories right after the gym <laughs> right anyway um so did that for a while and it was like right out of right out of college. And then I was just like getting so bummed out that that was like, I mean, looking back, no one ever said you suck at acting. They were like, you're just too big, you know, for the, the roles that you're going out for that your face dictates you would play or that your, you know, your specific acting, whatever would dictate that you would play. And um, now looking back, I'm like, oh, well, that really had nothing to do with my skill or whatever. It was just what they thought about my body. And, and everyone thinks something different, but uh, I just knew I had to do something else. And, um, I just wasn't happy. I was just working to work and not really, it wasn't really the life that I had imagined acting would be after college and realized I was kind of, you know, like a hamster in a wheel. And I think I saw a behind the scenes of Tomb Raider or something. I saw Angelina Jolie like kicking pads and I was like, oh, that girl's like her. Oh, wait, that's, that's her stunt level. Wait, that's a thing. That's right. Like totally blue, like Fast just hadn't even like over. thought of yeah, that i didn't even think of that as even being an option you know yeah and i i remember like i was living in this like little shoebox apartment in new york i loved it i don't get me wrong but i had this <laughs> little shoebox apartment a little loft bed and like cardboard on the loft and foam which was actually pretty comfortable more comfortable than most beds but i had very little <laughs> means at the time and i just remember 
Googling stunt people and stunt whatever and realizing it was a thing and then found a stunt school. And I was like, wow, this is like, this is for real here. And I directed one or two more things. I actually worked at uh, Penn State University at one of their satellite campuses in Hazleton. Uh, I was a teacher there and I ended up directing a show there right before I went to stunt school and like found this stunt school, sold everything that I owned. And I just was like, all right, well, let's, let's try this. It was probably one of the best experiences I've ever had. It was this like swamp in Florida and Groveland. And I learned, <laughs> um, I had like an amazing education though. I, I mean, to this day, um, Kim Kahana, his name is, and he's, oh my God, he must be almost 90 now. Cause I remember going to his 80th birthday party. Was it in Groveland? Um, yeah. It was in Gro- He's still there. That's great. Um, he's still like, like with it and like up every morning and like, you know, cutting down the, the bamboo and his swamp and like fixing up things and building. Like, he's just incredible. And his wife, Sandy, is <laughs> awesome. They kind of took me in as their own. I stayed after stunt school and helped out and like worked there like 6 a.m. to noon. I'd work there. Then I'd go work at Bonefish Grill and practice my stunts and things right after stunt school. Anyway, that kind of, that's kind of where I got my base education because I started getting into it in New York a little bit before I went to the stunt school in Florida. I went back to New York and, uh, well, did a little bit of uh, live shows and things in, in Florida and moved back to New York and just like hit the ground running and just started meeting people and being a little bit obnoxious. But for every like 100 emails I would send out, like one or two people would write back. I love it. Yeah. It kind of went on from there. Not a very easy thing to get into. It wasn't anyway in like 2007. Like not. Yeah. I, that's, I mean, that's amazing though. I mean, and, and I think like, I mean, first off, I love that you like just blasted people with emails because oh, yeah. it really is a numbers <laughs> game. I mean, yeah. Even like, I mean, obviously that's on a, that's on a bigger scale, but I mean, like, even like, you know, reaching out to like, you know, amazing guests like you, you have to really put yourself out there and actually ask people and try to connect with people. And you don't know who you can get connected with. Um, And kind of to go back on when you were talking about just the stress and anxiety level of trying to be in that business and trying to act like, what do you think about, what was it about acting that you just like, once you started it, you're like, this really isn't what I expected. This is fairly stressful. Other than, I mean, obviously them telling you you need to lose weight. Was there other factors of it that was just adding on stress? Well, yeah. I mean, I, I definitely, I would do like little shows. Like I did a uh, Greece out in Brooklyn and, um, but I was still working full time, like doing personal training. And I mean, I've had like every actor I'm sure has had so many like temp jobs and side jobs and that like actually working and doing the acting was uh, not where I was spending most of my time. And I just felt like if I'm going to be doing this job, at least, I mean, and of course, like taking acting classes and doing shows like that, that would also contribute to to the career. Um, but if I'm not really, if, if I'm just trying to stay afloat and I'm not doing what I really want to do, there has to be another way. Like, I, I don't want to live, uh, I don't, uh, I know this <clears throat> might come as a shock, but I'm not like uh, really stoked about waitressing or selling comedy <laughs> tickets in Times Square. So, and you know what, some people are amazing at it and they love it right. and that's their, their life goal, but it just wasn't mine. That wasn't my path of, it, it wasn't what I wanted to do. It was a great, honestly, great experience and a great time. And I wouldn't trade it for the world because working that hard and not sleeping and having some of the experiences, some good, most, uh, most, mostly good, um, you know, a lot of, a lot of bad as well, but, um, having that experience in that time was great, but knowing that that's not how I wanted to live my life. That's the good part about acting is being able to get into a character, get into the script, get into whatever. And even if it's, I mean, I did like a little PSA, like a non-union thing where I was playing a girl who like failed a, a driving test. And then, and then she found out she had an STD and it was like really sad. And then they went back and said, well, this is how the story would go if she were, if they wore a condom and <laughs> and uh, she still pa- she still like failed her driving test, but she was like smiling about it because at least she didn't have an STD. But um, yeah, <laughs> it's I don't, such, a, such a random mix for a commercial. It's, and I just remember thinking, this sucks. Like this is exactly <laughs> the acting I was picturing, you know, or you know, being fulfilled with. But I was like, there are other things that do fulfill me and and make me feel like a I'm training towards something. I think that's kind of was also the draw that even when I'm not working, I'm working and I'm working toward this goal. And I still, I, I realized I, I was a person, I've been a personal trainer since the day I was able to take my first test to become a personal trainer. Awesome. I was like training when I was in high school with like coaches and things. And I was like a little junior trainer and like they would start people off and I would like run the workouts with them and stuff. So I had a really 
solid foundation of biomechanics, kinesiology. And I also studied at NYU as part of my science curriculum, like anything that had to do with exercise science and, and all that. So that was super helpful in me getting out of this kind of temp job world and into more of like a fitness career, like job. Um, I would gladly have taken that as well. Like I, it's just something I really love to do. I felt like, well, that's pretty awesome that I can, when I'm not working, this job actually helps my job. It's not, um, right. I mean, obviously being an actor and being a waitress are very similar as well, but I didn't feel like, uh, I, I'm also a, a very anxious person and um, diagnosed ADHD and just kind of all over the place. I, I wanted to, I was the worst waitress. I, I think my strong suit was, I was what I lacked for in talent and actual ability I made up for in personality. But um <laughs> But I just was not, tips then, right? not very good. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I would, but I would always feel like I was letting down. Like I worked at Bonefish Grill in Florida and I just felt like I was always letting corporate down because I would like forget <laughs> the steak knife with the steak and I'd bring a spoon. And I'd be like, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> good luck eating that. You can press the spoon on the steak and get the juice. I don't know. Um, but yeah, I just felt, uh, I felt as though, and, and I could still act doing stunts, which is like the coolest thing, which actually just was able to do this past week, which is a lot of fun. Um, it, it's still going auditions and, uh, you kind of skip the whole, it's just a different route to get to, to those kind of jobs. You know, you go through a stunt coordinator, they'll submit you kind of stuff like that. But, um, yeah. And, and a lot of stunts and it, I'm grateful for my acting background because a lot of stunts and doubling is in fact, you have to really study the actor that you're doubling because you want to make sure you move like them. And I mean, obviously some things have to be a little different. Like I have to hide my face a little bit more, um, well, a lot more, but, um, I don't even know what your question was, but did I answer it? <laughs> Unless it's the chin, then you don't have to cover your face at all. You're just, oh, exactly. You're good exactly. Go. <laughs> um, yep. No, the, I, I kind of forget the question too. No, we were kind of talking about like <laughs> just the stress and anxiety mm -hmm. in being in that job. And um, oh, yeah. I know you were like, before we started chatting, you know, we were talking about ways that it affected you oh, yeah. um, on a physical level. And um, I think it would be super helpful to share that aspect of it because it's a lot of people that, I mean, not only in show business, but people that are not in show business have to deal with all of the time. Yeah. So if you, yeah, if you wanted to just dive into how it affected oh, you and how you overcame that. Well, in, in my like personal experience, and I see this, especially now with social media, people are seeing you and they're seeing your pictures every day. You know, it, it doesn't matter if you're in the business or not, your life is still, it's just so crazy to me how your life is still out there. You know, you're even more exposed than people that are in the business because at least when you're in film and television, they film the things they want to film. And in your own life, like you have the choice to post whatever pictures you want, but you're yourself and, you know, you don't have professionals for the most part. I think now, now people hire people to post their uh, Instagram stories <laughs> and things like that to make them look good. But, you know, um, in the biz, when I started doing stunts even, so I got out of that whole acting thing where you're too heavy, whatever, but now I'm in stunts and they're like, well, you have to double the actress. So uh, in, in a lot of cases, my arms are too thick. My legs are too thick. So I start doing not even just like CrossFit has kind of like a negative vibe to it these days, but I still, I think that's one of the things that really helped me stay strong and helped me mm -hmm. stay safe throughout my whole career. If you do it right, if you follow the actual programming and yep. you're not just in it for sport and you're not just in it to beat everybody and everything, it's actually really in my humble. Oh, I agree opinion. with you. I agree with you. The cross training of it's amazing. Yeah. Absolutely. And it, and it focuses on your own personal limits and, and things like, you know, my 75 year old friend can also do the same workout and just do it at her level. So anyway, I, I just like the full bodiness of it. And the fact that I was strong all over, I could do gymnastic things so I could actually do the job. So here's where training and fitness and acting and the art of doing stunt work itself, um, because it is definitely an art form because you want it to look as natural as possible and well this, looking uh looking completely out of control while being fully in control that's kind of the whole idea of stunt work you want to look like you're crashing and burning but you know how your body behaves in the air you know how to take a kick you know when to take a reaction you know uh there's things that we, you, know, you train so i didn't just like jump into stunt work I, I really really trained very hard to make that you know as seamless as possible but then you get to the part where okay now i, I can physically do all this stuff but now i'm trying to do this and double this actress. There aren't many, believe it or not, there aren't many actresses that have thick legs and built arms. And uh, it's very hard to um, work <laughs> consistently unless you're genetically, for the most part, I mean, this is just a you know, gross generalization, um, but unless you're kind of have a, a smaller 
genetic makeup and build and you're able to train and be strong. So I started to realize I was getting, I was building relationships in the stunt community. I didn't climb the ladder by dating and, and you know, everyone gets to where they want to be, however they want. Or, um, I, I didn't do any, uh, you know, ass kissing or, um, you know, sleeping my way to the top or into some jobs. So, um, I definitely wanted to go about it as, you know, just with hard work. And, um, I just remember having this moment when I was uh, an ND nondescript performer on a show and one of the stunt doubles, I was, she was a legend. And I was like, Hey, you know, I, I really look up to you. Do you mind if I ask you a couple of questions? And she's like, absolutely. And she's like, and after today, if you want to email me, you know, here's my email address and whatever. I had a little bit of an interaction with her. <clears throat> this is like really early on. And um, I emailed her and I was like, it was really great to meet you and blah, blah. And she wrote back, so you're, you're extremely talented. You've really got, you know, you really got yourself together. You have really a, a lot to work with. I'm really happy for you that you've stuck it out. Cause at this point it's, it had been years that I've been trying to get in and just carrying mats and just doing whatever I needed to do. Not really trying to, like I said, get ahead in any unethical manner. And, um, She's like, the one thing I, the one bit of advice I'd give you is you need to be smaller. You need to, you know, to double somebody. I'm just going to tell you, it's not going to be easy. And I'm going to suggest that you'll lose about 15, 20 pounds. I'm like, here we go again. Like yeah. back to, um, back to the, it just like flashback to like all those casting directors who are like, you got to be smaller. And I was just kind of floored. And I, I just remember like going to breakfast the next day or like waking up the next day and being like, well, I'm not going to have, you know, a big breakfast, I guess. Or like, I, I knew, I knew enough about nutrition and, um, to know that I wasn't doing any harm to my body, but if I wanted to be smaller, I guess less calories and, and you just, you know, start need eating less, but I am such a big proponent of food and I love food. <laughs> oh, I actually had a, a, pod, a podcast, a blog for a while that I'm rebooting and I might even have to ask you about podcast stuff. Cause it was called the hungry Whatever help help, you need, let me know. I'll (laughs) tell you everything that I use and what I like. And please, please reset the blog because I want to promote it for you because that sounds awesome. Yeah. And it was honestly, it was therapeutic for me because I had started to like restrict my eating a little bit, which then led me to eating copious amounts of desserts or foods when I was PMSing or when I was just like, I'll just eat a little bit here. And I just found myself like eating full, like half pints of ice cream. And your body's deprived. Oh, hell yeah. So I found myself like maybe once a month, I would be overindulging and I would feel kind of sick to my stomach as one does when they eat a pint of ice cream or like a half gallon of ice cream in approximately 10 minutes. And (laughs) I I was like, oh no, I think I'm going to, I think I'm going to be sick. So I'd like take myself to the bathroom. I hate throwing up, hate it. And I would vomit and I would be like, oh, I feel like a little bit better. And then I would try it again. I'd be like, okay. So that was like that week. I'm like, all right, I'll be fine. And like the following week, I would just find myself doing it again. And then it would be, you know, this would be every other week, then every week, then every day. And then a couple of times a day and not even realizing that, that I was even doing this. And in the middle of the night, one night I threw up just my stomach, just, I had a really bad stomach ache and my, I felt like someone was stabbing me with a knife. Then I went to the bathroom and, and I didn't, I didn't go to the bathroom with intentions of vomiting, but I just had to. And I realized I was like vomiting blood and I was like, Oh, that's kind of scary. So I went to like urgent care at night. I had, I lived in an apartment with this woman um, who was sleeping through the whole thing. I took myself there uh. and um, found out I had like an ulcer and, and then I took a really good look in the mirror and I was like, wow, I feel like my face is like gross and bloated and I just don't feel good. And I mean, this is months and months after um, it turned into probably more than a year. I had just moved back to the East Coast and the following Sunday was Easter. And this is like the moment. I think I, I might have been telling you about this, but I, I was traveling home to Pennsylvania because I was living in New York and uh, traveling home to Pennsylvania. I brought back a whole loaf of chocolate babka and sat in the driveway of my parents' house. And on the way home, I would just reach in the bag and like tear off a piece of the babka and eat it, which is, for, for anyone who doesn't know, it's the most delicious um, challah bread wrapped, the chocolate babka would be <laughs> rolled up with chocolate. They usually have like cin- cin- cinnamon, is like a, like a cinnamon roll, but I have trouble saying the word cinnamon. Anyway, <laughs> uh, I say cinnamon in uh, 
That's okay. I, I don't know how to spell cinnamon, so it's fine. That's like a word it's I can like never spell. <laughs> E's and N's and M's and things. Right. Yeah, all those words. Um, but uh, yeah, I just found myself like just having little bites on the way home. I'm like, so good. I, I want to make sure I have some before I give the rest to my family. I get home. I'm in the in the driveway of my parents' house, and I like tore off a huge chunk of it. And I'm realizing I just ate more than a half of this loaf. And let me just tell you, one thin slice of this is like three, four hundred calories. So, I ate like half a loaf, and I'm not only feeling bad in my head, but I'm feeling like a little sick to my stomach because I ate a half a loaf of challah bread with chocolate. And um, I was about like I was just thinking about how I would go to the bathroom, like excuse myself, and go like throw up a little to just to make me myself feel better because I didn't realize I ate like I was making all these excuses of why it was okay. And then I just sat sat there and I just started crying because I was like, wait a minute, I had a fight, I had an ulcer. Wait, this is all making sense. My face was gross. My body was just not happy. I'm not lifting. I'm like just totally depressed. Um, trying to do all these things to my body that it just doesn't want to do. And uh, just kind of admitting to admitted to myself finally for the first time that there was there's definitely a problem here. It was, it's not so clear cut. It's not like I just stopped eating and I got really skinny. It's not that I, you know, would eat and go to the bathroom and throw up and come back and that's bulimia and that's anorexia. It's just, it was just, you know, it came on so slowly, I guess, uh, that it didn't even realize it was happening. And I'm, I'd like to think that I'm someone that's super health conscious and in control of what I put in my mouth and what I do with my body. I've been a CrossFit trainer, a personal trainer my whole life and my whole adult life anyway. And, uh, yeah, it was, it was kind of an eye opener. And I found some resources online. There's some anonymous numbers you can call and things just to get yourself kind of in order and in check. And for someone to tell you, like, it's okay, that it's easy enough thing that a lot of people have, you're not, you know, same thing with like, I guess, mental illness has like a lot a big stigma attached to it as well. Like, you're not going to be on the front page of every paper tomorrow. If you tell me this anonymous person on a hotline that you probably have a problem that's right. affecting your health with food and a relationship with food. So I just decided that day I was just going to make a change. And I did. And I just was like, I'm going to learn everything I can about food and not so much how it's going to affect my body. Let's just or how, uh, body type and size. And like, if I want my bicep to be two inches smaller on this side and this thigh to be, you know, whatever. So I, just started from you know the ground up and and started researching and listening to different podcasts and reading and um, I found a bunch of research on my own and learned about Google Scholar and and now I think there's there are a couple of awesome new platforms that you can actually access full journals and studies and not just the reviews of the studies and so I'm you know did a lot of independent research I started working toward possibly a the registered dietitian uh, master's programs and stuff like that and classes and. That's really cool. That's, I mean, that's amazing. Thank you, first of all, for even sharing that part of your story, because I know like that's very personal, but like, I, man, it'll help so much. I mean, like, especially in that moment, I mean, like, it's a very like vulnerable time because you have all of these voices in your head telling you, you need to be this, you need to be this. And like, oh, yeah. um, so you would say your first steps after you realized in the car that it was an issue was like, did you actually call one of the numbers? Or- I, I was in the car with the car yeah. on. I don't know. I think I was like renting a zip car or something at that time. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I think I had a, an iPhone or something and I went on like, car still on tears coming out of my face, like Googling, like what is an eating disorder? What is this like free help, like whatever. And then I, uh, I should probably, I don't know if you have show notes or something, but maybe I could yep. get the, the actual link for that uh, to that for you um but it was just super non-threatening you don't give personal information it's like a like an anonymous national website and they have helplines and of course nowadays too people don't want to call people on the phone because people don't like to talk on the phone for whatever reason <laughs> um it's just so much easier to type through a screen but that's an option i think that in that moment i was like you know snots coming out of my face out of every orifice in my face and i was like not prepared to call a hotline you know so right. I thought there was like a chat on there and, you know, there's like a check mark here to, you know, make sure that you, you know, disclosure, whatever things. And I was like, I'll check the box. And I just started like typing to somebody. And that was, you know, that was it sitting in the parking, sitting That's in the driveway. Awesome. Yeah, definitely um, send me those resources for um, the show notes, because that could be extremely useful for somebody listening that might be dealing with that. And um, yeah. yeah, and I think you're spot on with just like, the more you can 
dive into it and like just educate yourself as much as possible. And like once you can learn more about food and the body and you just it, it just form you form a healthier relationship because you want to make better choices to serve your body and that affects literally everything else in your life. Yeah, absolutely. You can't, I mean, if you don't have food in your body, you're not breathing, like you're not alive. So, I mean, feeding your, like I said before, like feeding your body, meaning like having a green tea is still feeding your body, like whatever nourishes your cells and allows you to like live this on this planet and, and be your best self. But I mean, also with knowledge, comes sometimes you're like well, I know so much and I don't want to eat anything now <laughs> like kind of right. get to that point I'm sure that to anyone who's kind of started to delve into this stuff you're like well now I don't know what to eat because nothing's good and nothing's bad and nothing's good for you nothing's <laughs> organic and, but and I mean, you got to figure out what works best for you you know like you know it's funny because like I said you know Heidi and I've been like texting for months like just randomly trying to find a time that works well for both of us and she texted me like because you know we've been talking for months she texted me like 20 minutes before we started she's like it's cool I'm not vegan right <laughs> I <was just> like, <laughs> I'm like yeah I have people on that are vegan all the time um, so it made me laugh though when you texted sure. that. Sure. But you know, everybody has to figure out what you know works best um, for them and and go from there. But um, you know, Heidi, having gone through that, how has it affected how you interact with other women in in that space? Because there's, I mean, obviously, there's, I'm sure, a lot. I don't know how many are in um, are in the industry with like women and being stunt women. So. I'm sure women that are stunt women, you're probably somebody that gets reached out to a lot for questions or like to be mentored or, you know, things like that. So how has that affected how you interact with them? Because you've experienced all interactions and it's affected you on a mental level, on a physical level. So I guess how has that affected how you communicate with other aspiring stunt women or just people in the business in general? Well, I mean, aspiring stunt women, you know, in addition to, I mean, current the people that I work to, the people that I look up, and the other people that I look up to that I work with. I mean, I'm, I find myself even, you know, last week uh, on set and was, you know, working with other stunt women who are like, I know that everyone is struggling. Uh, a lot of, a lot of women, even if you're, like I said, like among the few that are genetically, you know, blessed, but I, I kind of go in the other way. How do I get stronger? How do I eat whatever, or, you know, resources? I'm not one to so I'll tell someone what to eat. I'm not a nutritionist. I'm not whatever, but having the knowledge that you can find out information and figure out what's good for you and um, just mentally even like meditation or yoga or something that kind of removes you from everything that you just kind of like let go, you know, I don't know if you've taken yoga or if you meditate or anything, but like yeah. just kind of let everything go for a minute and let's find yourself again for a second. And um, that's, a, you know, finding yourself and figuring out who you are, what drives you can actually point you in the direction of what you put in your mouth because is there, it's all habits. It's all about like, you know, well, I do like to eat this, that, the other thing, um, but working out physically, mentally, and uh, nutritionally, those are things that are very personal. And I find that when I start talking about it with people on set and, and females, obviously, specifically, and by the way, guys too have issues of getting bigger or getting smaller or like I have a dude friend who's shorter, but is stockier and all the actors he doubles are skinny and he was very unhealthy for a while, but, um, but especially females and, and in talking with women and we'll be on set and it's actually kind of fun we like support each other and I'm between sets, uh, between takes or something, we'll be in the trailer together and I'm like, let's do 20 squats together. Let's like, you know, move around a little bit and it kind of changes your mood and your outlook on things. And as far as food again is concerned, I would give my recommendations and what I would do for myself that I've been researching. I'm like, oh, check this out. I just found out about this. Or um, also, side note, I got to the point where I finally, I got, I, I started working on Blind Spot. It's the biggest job that I've had so far, like longest running. It was just perfect. It was everything in my skill set. And luckily, Jamie Alexander, who is a wonderful, amazing individual and human being, has hips like a normal woman and has like <laughs> the shape of a woman. So I didn't have to necessarily like I, I use the term loosely but starve myself into fitting into her pants or whatever it may be yeah. which I've done in the past but I've definitely had to adjust the way my body looked for other things and as there was a time when speaking of veganism that Jamie was vegan for quite a while and I saw her body changing I'm like okay guess I'll be a vegan for a while and that was fine <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I really didn't 
I just I love food and I loved like coming up with recipes and creation. I've just come to come to work every day with like bags and bags of vegetables just to feel like I was, you know, chewing on something throughout the day and it wasn't bad and uh, <laughs> learned a lot. And, you know, but the advice I would give to my friends on set kind of circling back to like other stunt women is like, you know, you got to take care of you first. And then this is a theme that comes up everywhere. I've actually I've listened to a bunch of our guests on your show and <clears throat> something that came up was like, you got to be like true to you and make sure that you're, you're serving yourself first. Cause you're not going to be good for it. You're not going to be good to anyone, whether it's on a film, whether it's your family, whether it's whatever to anyone else in this planet, if you're not good to yourself first and, and being healthy and getting to know where your limits and your boundaries are as far as, you know, well, how far can I take this while still being good to myself and good to my body uh, is a personal thing. And I think uh, it's better to toe the line of maybe not reach it. If you, you know, are heading in that direction, it, you, you kind of start sticking your foot in the water and you're like, oh, I'm starting to feel a little weak. I'm starting to feel like a little unhealthy here and just back off. I mean, that was the only bit of advice that I was giving my yeah. friends. And, you know, it, I just kind of got into that world for a while too, because after I helped myself, I was able to help others. Right. Well, I mean, you learn so much in the process because you're trying to help yourself. You're trying to help your right. friends and coworkers, and uh, and mm -hmm. now you're you're working on being a reg registered dietitian. So you're just gonna be a boss by the time this uh, right. blog reboots, right? Well, uh, yeah, and you know what? I'm gonna I'm gonna tell you right now. I've realized that I've the process of doing that's going to be a little bit much. So what I decided was because I you know, your, your credits and things, if you try to go like online schooling and stuff after two years, you have to redo it. So I realize I'm just going to be constantly redoing classes. So I'm just going to keep learning. And then if I get to a point in my life where I'm able to finish that, that degree, that's going to be great. But for now, at least I have access to scholarly journals and I can awesome. refer people to those or people, I, um, people like you or people who have uh, the actual piece of paper that says you can ask me things and I can tell you answers legally. So. <laughs> <laughs> no, but that's amazing that's though. I mean, no, I love it. And I love that you've taken educating yourself so seriously because it's, I mean, I think it's obviously one of the most important things, especially if you're trying to live a sustainably healthy life and you're not just trying to go from like, lose a certain amount of weight, gain it back and like a really fad diet type of thing. Like you have to like right. learn how food affects your body. Cause I mean, if you really want long-term health, you have to, and like, not only that, you want long-term health and a healthy mindset with it uh, as well. And um, you were, you were talking about like you were every once in a while, you might tell somebody about a resource or a program or like maybe like an app that was helpful for you, whether mm -hmm. it is, um, you know, mindset wise or, or fitness or anything like that are there any um like apps or any programs that you personally like or like i mean i think you mentioned like yoga and things too um what resources do you personally really like to go back to well currently i have i got a peloton in December. i am very jealous every time you post that on your instagram story like i see it and i'm like oh, i'm so sad i love it. it's um i like was almost embarrassed i'm like no like uh, i'm gonna like like it for a month i'm gonna put it back but um i think and it doesn't have to be a Peloton, but like I have a Peloton and I realized that they have this like program where they just have like a bunch of, bunch of stuff on like yoga and strength. And it's funny. One of the guys, I, I was a personal trainer, like I said, and one of my buddies, Andy Spear is now like one of the biggest strength training guys on Peloton. And he's got like a hundred thousand followers on his, it's so crazy how that, that stuff blows up. But <laughs> I have to tell you, like, it's, I'm almost, like I said, almost embarrassed, but like I, I kept, I had the 30 day to the 30 day, like, if you don't like it, we'll come to your house and take it out. And I'm like, all right, I will have them come to my house and take it out if I don't use it. But, and I didn't use it every day, but I, I felt like it was something that got kind of like, I just got like a house in the woods and not really close to any gyms. It just got me moving in the morning. And sometimes like mentally, that's all I need is to like start moving and do something. It doesn't matter if it's a Peloton or if you can put on an app and do yoga or whatever. Um, I also do like a little daily devotional in the morning, like mentally. And I don't know if, I don't know if you know Ben Greenfield, um, but yeah. I religiously follow his podcast. And uh, I mean, he kind of gets into like microdosing psilocybin and, and the, all that kind of stuff. It gets a little bit beyond where I'm at currently and where I am currently in my uh, journey, my longevity journey. But um, doing the Peloton's great because I have the app and I could do yoga or whatever. Um, I mean, I'll have to look on my phone because I do have other like apps that I use daily but that's awesome I want a Peloton just to do like I um I heard have you ever heard of uh Robin um Ar I think it's Robin yeah. Arzon do you do oh, her yeah. classes yeah I heard Dude. her on uh she was on the ritual podcast a few times and like she was really cool and 
I really yeah. got to check this out now because they've heard you talk about the ritual podcast a few times. And oh, I'm it's like, awesome. You would like it. And it's not just it's not just vegan either. Like um, he no, has like a lot of mindset, like even like yeah, meditation, yoga. Uh, yeah, it's a very, very wide variety of guests. But you would like it for sure. Oh, totally. I dig like wellness. I don't know if you ever like heard Wellness Mama, but she's got that. Um, she's got like a new wellness with an e, like wellness with an e on it. And I've been checking out her products because she's just like awesome. Oh Take yeah, because they're like like lotions and like toothpaste and yeah, things like yeah, that yeah. without toothpaste like the chemicals and, and yep. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, I, I've been getting like blown up with Instagram ads, but it's totally something that oh. I would buy. So <laughs> I'm not mad at all. I kind of yeah, I was kind of following that stuff before it started really becoming a thing and like just following her. I don't know if it was like from Ben that I found her, but uh, she just like reminds me of if I had a husband and six kids, I would probably be doing that same thing. She is like just constantly <laughs> Does she have six kinda, kids? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, wow. I know. She has like a small army. It's crazy. That is definitely a small army. I'm pretty sure. So. I'm, now I'm get, second guessing, but I'm, I'm like 87% sure she has like six kids. But <laughs> it's impressive. Inspiring. It is. Um, have you ever used the app, uh, either Headspace or Insight Timer? Yes. Those are really, both really great for, for meditation. Yep. I was doing Headspace uh, for a long time. And then uh, I did, I totally dig Headspace. Even if it's like like a little 10 minute, like morning uh, meditation is awesome. Cause I just don't even have to think I'm like, all right, I'm going to do this and just hit play. I, I'm, but then there are times where I just don't even want to be near my phone in the morning. Like I, I have like a time that I check all my emails and a time that I do all this stuff. So I try not to do like too many apps and things, or if anything, I'll put on like radio, like NPR or some sort of like news. So I get caught up quickly, but yeah, it's, it's very hard to get into a routine when like you shoot nights and shoot days and yeah. don't sometimes I, I've been staying in like hotels. So I have like my it, getting into some sort of routine is like the healthiest thing possible. Like having a sleep ske- schedule, sleep number one will help set everything else in emotion. Like food. Great. But if you don't even eat, as long as you're sleeping correctly and it's absolutely like that's super duper number one, if you can, if you can help it. And if you're on a weird schedule, because you're on 12 different TV shows that don't have the same <laughs> schedule, and you make do and you bring stuff to your ho- like, I have these two huge like Trader Joe's bags that I bring to the hotel. There's a coffee maker in because I can't live without my coffee. <laughs> but it's like I have my key on coffee or bulletproof, like super organic, clean coffee, right. and my little coffee grinder and my filters. And like, I, I don't want to compromise like having, you know, bad Low coffee pot. and brain yep. fog. Yeah. So, yep, my little healthy snack bag and like my fruits, my go to. So, when I come home from the hotel, I'm not like snacking on the microwave popcorn they left for you there. I'm like actually setting myself up for success. It's like maybe Four Sigmatic, you know, coffee and mushrooms. And do you like Four Sigmatic? I do. I was a little like when I got it in the mail, like, oh, so it's like a pack of instant coffee. That's weird. But then, you know, I, I just have been reading so much about how all these mushrooms can be super helpful with energy. And like I said, I have ADHD and I, I've been prescribed, this is, might be a little too much for you now, but like I've been prescribed um, Adderall for a while. I actually took a whole year before I even tried it because I didn't, I felt like I should be able to combat the symptoms of ADHD naturally, which you can. Um, mm-hmm. It's very hard. I mean, it's just very time consuming. And it got to the point where I just, there weren't enough hours in the day and it might be a cop out, but I started like taking child size doses while I was working. And it just made such a huge difference with such little I don't have any of the I don't have any of the good side effects either you're like helping your appetite and stuff but I ended up just taking it enough to get through the work days that I needed and, and this is totally a personal thing this is not like a recommendation for anyone to like take drugs but it just took me going through all of the natural things and realizing that I could actually achieve this for instance like doing bulletproof coffee in the morning what you can do like a vegan version of that as well um I, I believe and don't come yeah that, I think a lot I, of people, people do like just co- like coconut oil instead of butter. Right. Um, yeah. Or like, like that. The high yeah. quality MCT oils and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, yep. And, uh, and yeah, it's super, super helpful. And if I just, you know, sometimes I can't do that in the morning because job or because of whatever. And so, you know, we're, we're not, we're not perfect as human beings I've realized. And that's another thing I had to kind of come to terms with, <laughs> but, um, but yeah, bulletproof coffee really does clear the mind and it helps. It's a very similar effect actually to, um, taking something like an Adderall, like a, a dexamphetamine. Um, uh, but uh, I forgot what I was going to say. It doesn't matter. The, um, <laughs> you were talking about the Four Sigmatic. I haven't, I oh, haven't right, tried right. that um, that specific brand. I have tried. I mean, I'm sure it's very similar. Uh, but like the, uh, it's the brand is. I'm pulling up their Instagram. Uh, it's just real, real mushrooms is the brand, and oh, it seems yeah. to be really high quality as well. But I, I have yeah, a few. Um, and, 
Yeah, yeah. yeah I have a few packs, and um, I like it. Like, I have one that's um, like a focus energy one, and like, I really, it oh, really helps. Like, it's yeah, I like it a lot. But I'm sure it's pretty similar to Four Sigmatic. Have you, you tried them both? Yeah, um, I have another one that's not the the real mushrooms one, but I I've tried the Four Sigmatic, and then I have one in my cabinet. I hope the headset doesn't go off. I'm just looking in my. <laughs> I've been taking Cordyceps. It's just called Host Defense, but I. I uh, went to this float tank place in Pennsylvania and they had... Oh, I am jealous of that. Oh, yeah. Uh, quick, funny story. I injured my finger a while back and I had to work and I was trying to do everything I could to like heal my finger. It was super swollen. I couldn't bend it. It was ligament damage. So I was like, oh, I'll go to the float tank place and I'll put it in this like salt bath for an hour and I'll float. So it turns out if you're floating on your back, my finger just was not even going in the water. So <laughs> I like put my hand under my lower back to get it to even stay there. And then I was like, oh, this sucks. But um, anywho, they had the they had a bunch. I was asking them about mushrooms. And they're like, oh, we actually have a bunch of supplements. They had CBD, um, which I also bought like a CBD salve. That is the first time that CBD ever did me any good because I tried that before and the ingesting CBD just for anxiety and sleep and all that. Mm-hmm. And I, after doing more research, found out that it does like about 30% of people, it just doesn't have that effect on orally, um, unless you're taking like over hundred milligrams. So that's also another rabbit hole you can go down. But, um, anyway, that that's where I found these cordyceps. And then from there, I was reading about four sigmatic, like for, what four sigmatic even means, like what the name came from. And then, you know, been reading about the mushrooms and stuff and ordered some just to give it a shot. And I dig it and I kind of I really like the flavor it's really like earthy without mm-hmm. it doesn't, it's not like I'm drinking a mushroom but it's like it's like a really earthy coffee and I don't really like like fruity coffee anyway so kind of worked out for me I know I had a lot more energy yeah for sure I actually I took a month and a half coffee break and today is my first yeah. day back <gasps> from that month and a half co- and it was great oh my god I have How, had a great morning. it's been fantastic were you like a new like appreciation like you're like oh coffee never tasted so oh bad. yeah because then you know like you know when you drink too much coffee and it just like it almost wears you down sometimes like it, I, I know for me like I can't drink it every single day or it'll just make me more tired so like having a month and a half off it kicks in so fast like after we jump off this call I'm probably gonna like full clean the whole house because I feel so productive but I uh I yeah it was it's nice to take the break and um I love that you have um, kind of to go back. I, I love that you have that routine when you travel because your hours are so crazy. And oh, yeah. that's what I was going to ask you kind of about too, is because like, because your routine is all over the place. I mean, you're as, as far as your schedule, mm-hmm. what do you try to keep as kind of like your, you know, cause your body, I mean, your job is your body basically. Right. So you right. have to have certain things you do every day before work, after work, maybe during a job. So like, what does that look like for you kind of on like a prehab rehab every day, making sure your body is, is where it needs to be at all times? So I have, um, I don't necessarily have one thing that I do every day, but I do have a handful of things that depending on the day I will do. So um, I travel with my hypervolt, my self massager, number one, because I don't know if I'm going to have time to warm up without getting sweaty. If I'll have the space, I just I use that to like, as like a, you know, check in for all my muscles, make sure everything's like working right. Um, most uh, before work, um, if I'm doing anything, it's it's just a, a super reminder to myself to stay warm, like warm up your, your muscles and your body. So I always carry something that I could, you know, either self um, mat, like a mashing tool of some sort, like a lacrosse ball or something, mm-hmm. just to make sure that um, I can warm up and I can hit any of my tight spots and that's when all injuries happen is when you're cold you go from like zero to 100 as you know in virginia in december working on the um world beyond that was awesome like they they just put out like a bunch of ads for it It looks so cool but uh yeah last episode i had the opportunity to go down and and double someone whose main stunt double was working on something else and it was very very cold in this house uh that we were in ironically it was a lot lot was happening but it it was like a fight scene and i um uh, I just had to keep, keep warm, keep warm. And sure enough, like I pulled a little hammy right in the beginning. I, I was just like, Oh man, just staying warm and staying mo- mobile the rest of the day. But even sometimes trying your best to stay warm, it's, you know, it was very cold. It was like one, of the, one of the coldest nights in Virginia. Uh, we shot overnight and, uh, dude, just, yeah, keeping your, your muscles warm. But, um, as a daily thing, I would either use that or I have a foam roller, some sort of mashing in the morning just to get the, the white tissue of fascia kind of moving around a little bit um, physically. I do. 
I definitely every day I have like amino acids. I believe I think these Kian ones might even be vegan, but uh, just to stay consistent and make sure that I'm you know saving my muscles. Um, and like we talked about, like other supplements, like doing like coffee or mushrooms or doing mushrooms sounds kind of funny. But, um, <laughs> not but doing mushrooms, kids. Not doing, not doing yeah. mushrooms. No, no, no. <laughs> but you know, stay, staying along like the natural lines. Um, and I have just, uh, I try to do, uh, not I try, I actually, this is something I do every day is I'll do like a sun salutation or I'll do a couple of, you know, chaturanga type pushups, um, a, a specific set of exercise things that I just want to, you know, grease, the, what's it called? Grinding the gre- grease in the gro- groove, something like that. You know, like great. every time you, you walk in and out of my office, I have a pull-up bar. I'll do one pull-up or something if I'm at home. Or if I'm on the road, I'll do, you know, burpees. I do burpees a lot because my job is literally falling down and getting up. So I do throughout the day, I'll just do like a bunch of burpees. Um, like that's kind of like a routine, something that's in my, my wheelhouse and in my, my toolbox for my everyday things. I always have bands because bands just provide resistance. If I'm on the road, if I'm in a hotel room, it's, it's, uh, I, I don't normally have time to do a full hour workout or even sometimes a half hour. So I'll have to do throughout the day, like five, 10 minute little things to just keep my joints in order. And it's, and honestly, that's, I mean, that should be applied to most people, especially most working, busy people. Like you don't have to have an hour, like you can do small things throughout the entire day and it adds up. Yeah, absolutely. And like I was saying earlier with my friends on set, like we're throughout the day, we're in the trailer together. We're kind of waiting to go back on set. Let's just do like 10 squats together. And after the 10, you're like, Oh, it took a few seconds, less than a minute. And I feel so good now. I don't feel I'm not like sweating all over, you know, just like full body motion. And like working on this film, I got really sick because I was not sleeping. And just, just goes to show you how much sleep can really affect your body, your hormones, uh, your mood. I like breaking out and everything. But having done that and made, making that mistake, now when I'm at my computer, I have the Apple, I don't know if you have an Apple watch or something, but they give you like stand up every 12 hours. You're like stand up, you've been sitting down too long. That's so true. You, you get lost in your computer and your work and just stand up, just even like touch your toes or do some squats or something like that. So like you do that throughout the day. And then when you get back, do you have something that you do post work? Or is it just like, it's been a rough day of being like thrown around, like you just want to go to sleep? If Depending on what I did for the day, if I did something that was just like physically taxing, I definitely would do some sort of recovery yoga type thing. Or if I don't have the space for it, just making sure I move my body a little bit before I go to bed. So I don't kind of wake up with a cramp in my rib cage or something. But as far as like bruising, um, actually end of blind spot, we we finished filming around November last year and last season starts this summer, season five. Love I'm episodes. excited and sad. <laughs> I know, me too. <laughs> that's that was me like filming the whole last season. But I'm actually it's kind of cool because it's like, oh wait, it's back. I get to see it now. I get to see yeah, it. Well, I'll find out what happens. But um, <laughs> spoiler alert, I got a lot of bruises um, <laughs> filming the last episode, and uh, I did come home and I, I do, I have these bags of Epsom salts, and um, I can't always like, business hours are are a joke for me because I'm never available to do anything during quote business hours because. I'm usually home at midnight and back out at work at 4 a.m. or whatever. So I can't go to a float tank, generally speaking. So I just dump a bunch of Epsom salts with like lavender in my bathtub and soak soak the night away. I, I'm one of the few people that I know. I don't really know many people like me. Maybe there are others out there, but I don't like baths because I feel like I'm in soup. I feel like <laughs> I'm making Heidi soup. So I was like, oh, go home and take a nice relaxing bath. I'm like, it's not relaxing to me. I'd rather <laughs> go into like a sauna, an infrared sauna, and just know that I'm at least, you know, d- get doing some cellular autophagy and I'll do some push-ups and get my, you know, my body burning and know that when I come out of there, I'll be healthier for it. I just don't want to sit and soak in a bath and be like, oh, this is relaxing. Not relaxing to me. <laughs> but, uh, you know, if I got the salt going on at least, and then the lavender helps too, like lavender oil, or sometimes the salts have some lavender oil in it. And, eucalyptus or whatever but uh that is definitely a go-to for me for bruising and then i i I can't stress enough how much (laughs) i've learned that arnica cream works at least for me the gel really Uh, getting the bruising out anyway i just i feel like i do my salt bath i do my arnica and a little bit of if i can take it or if depending on how fresh the bruise is i'll do a little bit of the hypervolt just to kind of break things up and move it around but um yeah hypervolt or some sort of massage percussion tool. Is that oh. is that the is that the brand of the percussion tool that you use? Yes. And 
I just got the Mark Mark II, yeah, the um, muscle sim uh, electrode thing. Um, nice. Well, when you start your podcast, you have a lot of products that can, you could <laughs> that would sponsor I you did, now. I'm realizing that I'm like totally <laughs> I'm like, like writing all these down. ad for these. Right. But I just got my Omega juicer. I'm really happy right. about it. <laughs> oh, um, the Omega juicer is awesome. I'm oh totally on board God. with that one too. It's so easy to clean. I, I yep. had the, the Breville ones and they were like, oh, it's so easy. I'm like, it's really not though. It's kind yeah, of Yeah, that the Omega one was the first one that I, I mean, it's first and only one I've had. It, it's so well quality. I've had it, gosh, I mean, I don't even know, like six, seven years. Like it's it's amazing. Oh, good to know. Yeah. Yeah. I, I waited a full year before I bought one because my friend had one in California and we just maybe had a couple of drinks the night before and wanted to have some juice in the morning and like fresh <laughs> Green, green juice and ginger and beet and stuff. And I was like, this is so cool. I just love watching it work. And then we used the leftover stuff and we made like veggie burgers with it. So I was like, That's I awesome. was totally, I want one. I'm going to wait because it's expensive and the year went by. Yeah, it's definitely worth the purchase though. It's yeah, it's amazing. Oh, yeah, like it. are there like, obviously your job is you putting yourself in dangerous situations, but obviously it's, it's dangerous, but at the same time, it's what you've trained to do. So it's not as dangerous for you because you've really worked your way up to that. First off, have you ever been so hurt that you can't finish a job? Or is there just like certain situations that you don't put yourself in now? Um, A little bit of both. So uh, there has been one occasion, uh, one thing that happened where um, I, I, I had one injury that happened, but uh, it was a neck injury, actually. And um, it, I don't know if you know anything about like neck stuff, uh, you know, like whiplash, like you're in a car accident and you feel yeah. like two days I'm later. A, I'm a chiropractor, so I've, I've got you on yeah. this one. Okay, <laughs> perfect. I'm like, I know you do like, the, yeah. Okay. So um, I had unknowing, I did, I did a high fall and it was a one in a like, billion chance. Like I did everything right. I did two takes, second take. And this is like a very, I'll try to like breeze through this because this is like a whole another hour of whole other hour of, you know, talking about it. But second take, uh, landing equipment failure ended up herniating a disc and uh, fracturing or parts of C5 and C6. So um, that disc was like totally like shot. I didn't realize it. I, I knew something happened. I felt something happened when I hit. And luckily because of training, I, I mean, stunts are calculated risk. They're as calculated as possible, but there's still the risk factor. Um, I think funny enough, I feel like the actresses that I double tend to get hurt more than, than I do. <laughs> <laughs> but um Again, this was just like an unforeseen thing. It's it is the risk, and like one in a billion chances that the way that this box was like corrugated and structured just happened to catch under my shoulder in a way that slid into my neck. And because I had the technique of putting my head to the side from doing martial arts my whole life, I I very well may have. And to every doctor that has heard this and seen my neck and everything, they said that you probably saved your spinal cord because you turned to the side and used your muscles to kind of protect your spinal cord and everything, instead of it being straight on, if my chin went like straight to my chest when I landed, there's a good shot that because there are no muscles, you know, on the, the flat part of your back that it could have totally damaged my spinal cord and I could have been paralyzed, like all these crazy, yeah. crazy things. But um, so that's an instance where technique came in and really kind of saved me from, well, I, I still think it saved me from what could have been like something totally horrible, like catastrophic. But, and that goes back to like the whole, training your body and like CrossFit and being strong, you have to like really listen to your body. And if you're not genetically gifted to be small, don't try to be, you know, um, especially in this business where you're getting beat up all the time. But uh, yeah, two days later, I was back on that job. And all of a sudden it was like, I felt I took a little nap in my car because it was, we went from days to nights. So I took a nap in my car before getting on to where we were shooting the night shoot. And then slowly I felt like, oh, I just like maybe I slept weird in the car. And then within an hour, I just started to feel the most excruciating pain to this day in my life, like constant pain other than dislocating my elbow, which is another kind of excruciating pain, um, which didn't happen doing stunts, ironically. Um, <laughs> I, I was like slowly starting to feel it. And then to the point where my, my whole left arm was in so much pain that I had to kind of like make a fist. And you probably know this better, the, uh, the nerve, like, I wanted to make it the nerve like as small as possible. So I was like crunching my, I call it my T-Rex arm where like uh, <laughs> almost, right. almost was like making a weird. So my left hand just to kind of subside some of the nerve pain um, walked on to set. Someone like touched my right shoulder, which had nothing, like it was all like on my left side. So I'm just with my right shoulder and all I felt was this electrical like uh. shock. Of, like it felt like someone had a samurai sword and was like slicing open my body with it. It was so like incredibly That's painful. Crazy. 
And I tried to hold it in and I actually immediately started texting somebody that I knew could double this person I was doubling on the show. And um, I was like, are you available to work? And then I told my boss, I think something's really wrong. Can, do you have any like Advil or something? Of course, I'm just like, give me some Advil because that'll help. And uh, <laughs> I just threw, I had to leave. They eventually took me to the, to the hospital and they gave me an MRA first, MRI first. They screwed up the MRI. Then they did an MRA, screwed up the MRA. Um, and anytime I was lying supine, it was just like the most excruciating pain that, I mean, I, I had to sit up to not be in as much pain, but I was like laid down and I was just, I don't, I was trying, I, mean, I, I wasn't crying, but like water was falling out of my eyes and I was laying on the, the MRI, <laughs> the MRI table. But uh, yeah, eventually found out that like, yeah, I did some damage and it just like my adrenaline helped me get through that moment. And then like, yeah, just something, I guess I moved actually, this is what they say. Like I moved in a way that kind of like opened up the discs on the side, like maybe the way I was laying down in my car or on this, on my, on my stump bag in the trailer, kind of like allowed it to kind of like seep out and then touch the nerve or do whatever it does to the nerve. That so what did they do? This. Did you have that surgery or was it just like a, um, well, a rehab situation? It's so funny. Cause surgeons just want to cut you open. And I was yeah. like, I don't want to <laughs> like, right. I got the pain happened. Right. And then I didn't think the pain was a problem for some reason. Like, yes, I lost strength. Yes, I, you know, wasn't doing so well. But first of all, it, I know it's still inflamed. I just had the injury. Everyone wanted, cut, like surgeons, doctors wanted to cut me open. I was like, can we just try other things first? I'm in like a state of shock still, you know, it's only been like a month or two and I was doing my own research, thank God. And I, you know, I, I have like every book on like rehab and like I have Kelly Starrett's books. I have like, um, I've been rehabbing my own body for a long time. We need like a rehab book, uh, book club because I oh want to see God, all the books yes. that you have. Oh <laughs> my God. Mail I, I mean, to each other back and forth. Seriously. Like that's, <laughs> and I just got Ben Greenfield's new, like encyclopedia. I just, oh, that's I awesome. Love it. But, um, seriously, I, I think I started getting these books and things because I couldn't afford the healthcare <laughs> and to get into the healthcare system. So I was like, I just heal myself as much as possible before I, you know, seek out doctors and try to pay out of pocket. So it kind of right. started like that. And I've always been into health and fitness and whatever. So, and my mom's a massage therapist, which was also convenient growing up. Very helpful. Athlete. Yeah. Yeah. So I had an idea that I had an inkling that I really didn't need to jump into surgery right after hurting my neck when I knew that, okay, I got to a certain point with the pain and it just leveled out there. I mean, it was horrible and excruciating and my nerve hurt, but I was like, if I'm not getting worse at this point, let's just see if I can get better first before, you know, cutting my neck open and replacing the disc or fusing my spine and then creating a weakness above and below that spot, especially with the impact that I do with my job. And yeah, it, just something that wasn't necessary at the moment. You can, you can always have the surgery. And let's be honest, the later you wait, the longer you wait with something that's not going to necessarily change um, the, the technology is just getting better. So in, in this specific, in my specific case, Heidi's case, yeah, like, I'm and not, I could tell you, like, I, there are so many like people that have, that I've just seen on like a, like a patient level, just, I can't, I honestly, I can't tell you one person that's had spinal surgery. That's been like, that's the best decision I've ever made. I'm pain-free. Oh. It's better than what I thought before. Like nobody ever says that everybody's like, I wish I wouldn't have had it. And, and obviously like, listen, that's not like, don't take that advice and run with it. Like always see your, oh, always talk right. to your, your physician, obviously. But from just what I've seen firsthand, you don't see that. You don't hear that. It's uh it's crazy. And, and you're right. Surgeons are good at what they do, but their main instinct is to, I want to cut, which again right. is super necessary. And I'm so glad that we have like a system that is they're very good at what they do. But if you can make it better so you can avoid it, that's obviously the best route to go. But um, right. but again, everybody's in, in a different. Case, yeah. yeah, yeah. And everybody's at a different place with, you know, different injuries and, and whatnot. So please don't right. take that advice and run with it. Mm -hmm. But in a lot of cases, like there's things that you can do to, uh, you know, make it better. So yeah, it's crazy. I, yeah, I, I, that's why I was like going to say again, my specific case, like I wasn't losing feeling or I wasn't get losing strength at, at, at any sort of rate or I, you know, I was testing my strength and it's, it wasn't, it was still less than my right hand, but it wasn't necessarily getting worse. And I think that was one of the pillars of uh, key, key advice, bits of advice that um, a buddy of mine, her dad's a, an orthopedic surgeon and he was kind of like, my guiding light through this whole thing. I went through all these like neck doctors and spinal surgeons. And I just kind of on a whim, I was like, you know, I'm going to call so-and-so and see if he has any advice. And he said, if I was, 
if he had an option with a with a patient where the patient wasn't getting worse, they weren't losing whatever, it would be not uh, it would be frowned upon for him to give the advice to get surgery before seeing if it could be healed in, in any other way. So it, him saying that was like basically like you know you're not going to if you fall directly on top of your head, yes you might like I just didn't want it to happen so that the next time I fell I was going to be paralyzed. Right. He's like if you are able to heal yourself from this, you have just the same amount of risk as anyone else on this planet. If you fell directly on your head, that you'd be paralyzed. Like there's no, you're not going to, you know, back up into a wall and then be paralyzed. You're not like, that's not going to happen. Your bones have probably already healed as far as where the fractures were. And the disc is just going to be how, how many people do you know that don't have herniated discs that are like athletes of some sort and in, in the stunt industry, I'm sure everyone that I know anyway, probably has some degree of, uh, of herniation or bulging disc or, you know, just the nature of slamming your body around, you know, as prepared and as fit as you can be. It's, you know, cement versus skin and bone. Uh, cement generally <laughs> wins. <laughs> Usually, yeah. So, you know. Yeah, that's, uh, that's, that's crazy. And that's, I mean, that, but that's really cool that you did take like those methods to improve and get better. And I mean, obviously you're still doing amazing at what you do. So obviously it's, uh, it's working. Yeah. I mean, hot, I just tried every, oh, that was the other thing. I, I'm, I, I can't tell you how much, and I'm sure you know this or feel this as well, that um, being able to sweat and move around is so good for, I mean, you do sweat every day or at least be active every day for your mind and not just like your body and how you look, just overall cell health and mental health. And the fact that I couldn't really, I was going to the gym at one point after this you know, happened. I, I obviously took a little time, like a week or two to completely just not move and try to like recover and drink fluids and juices and did as much, you know, holistic therapy things as I could. And I eventually was like, I'm going crazy. I have to go to the gym. I went and I went on the Stairmaster and I held my, like I tied my arm to my body so that I would <laughs> not create any sort of like, you know, aggravation to my nerve. That was, you know, number six nerve. Is that right? Um, but I was like, not, I was kind of like, if you can imagine like the stairs moving from underneath me, but if I had like a glass of water on my head, I wouldn't move my body. So I was like, just moving my legs underneath me as the stairs were moving. And I did it for like 20 minutes. And I think I was sweating because I was just trying not to cry the whole time. But I was like, okay, this isn't working. And I'm just really, um, and just in a lot of pain. And then I, I was like, you know what, I should go into one of those hot yoga rooms. Like I wasn't going to go in a sauna. So I just was like, well, I'll just walk out of there. But if I'm in a room with people doing yoga, Maybe I can like stand up or kneel down or like maybe twist to the side or something, something. And I can leave the room if it hurts. And I wasn't sure how heat was going to affect it. And I did my first like, you know, Bikram type class. It was, you know, the 26 posture class. I was able to do two. I wasn't able to lay on my back. I was barely able to kneel down. I could put one arm up and like tick tock to the side. And I was like, oh, that actually felt amazing. I left that class all sweaty and I felt a hair better. And I was like, if I'm feeling a hair better, and I do it every day, you know, pretty soon I'll feel like a ponytail better. So there you go. <laughs> and it's true. And I started doing one pose and one posture and two postures and three. And then over the, because it's the same 26 or whatever, over time that combined with dry needling and acupuncture and like paying out of pocket for the things that I was hoping and praying and believing would help, you know, 10 months later, I was hundred percent and got the job on blind spot. It was perfect. Oh, that's so cool. Yeah. I love that. I love that so much. And yeah, you healed up just in the, the right timing, huh? Oh my God. <laughs> so thing like, yeah. Cause I mean, blind, that's, that's a really big deal. And obviously that's a so long term. I mean, what has it been? Five, five seasons? Five Four seasons. Six? Yeah. I mean, I came in toward the, uh, I was an actor stunt performer in episode nine and 10. And then uh, I think because I was on then, I kind of was looked at in um, taking over for Jamie's stunt double toward the end of the first season uh, when they were looking for somebody. And I had an inkling that because her stunt double and I, we got along really well. She's awesome. Her name's Kai Furneaux. And she was like, um, they're looking at people to kind of like take over for me and I want to pitch you. And so I started like really watching the old episodes and trying to like mm -hmm. match the bodies and all that kind of stuff. So when I went in to do a rehearsal, they were like, Oh, she's, a, she moves like Jamie. I'm like, yeah, totally <laughs> naturally. Totally didn't study any of this. No. So no, it's perfect. And like I said, Jamie has like a normal woman shaped body, which is good for me. So now she seems actually like really cool. Uh, she is really cool. That's the biggest project up until that point that you had worked on, right? Well, it, it was the most, I would it, not the biggest production necessarily, but it's the biggest, it's the most long-term job I've had. Um, so but prior to Blindspot, I had done like 
a bunch of like movies. So I actually did the whole first season of Taxi Brooklyn with Kyler Lee. I was her stunt double, uh, which not a lot of people have seen. Um, it's, it's an interesting show, but uh, now <laughs> she's on Supergirl. But I, it was funny because growing up, everyone was like, you look like little Gray, Lexi Gray. And then <laughs> she came to New York to do this show and I got to double her for, you know, that whole season. Um, that was probably my first like really long-term job. And then Blind Spot was just, you know, crazy seasons and traveling overseas and doing crazy like rooftop sites in Japan, you know, little stuff. That's, like that. <laughs> that's awesome. Was it what you expected that it would be that whole, um, uh, that whole process and um, yeah, all just, of it. Oh my goodness. I honestly didn't know what to expect. I, I make things to be way scarier and way harder in my head, um, which I think is good to be overprepared and um, to be, uh, you know, overperform and uh, then the opposite, but it turned out to be, because I was on such like a mission to get myself back into shape and back into order and fix my neck and all this kind of stuff. I was in like the perfect headspace to kind of jump into something that would require all of my attention and focus and time. And it ended up being even better than I had anticipated. Like the character them itself, the Jane Doe character, like her background and her athletic uh, athleticism and, and whatever is pretty much everything that I've trained in, in my life for the most part. I mean, there are a couple like specialty things where they would bring in someone to do the skydiving um, or there was a, a rock climbing thing that I can rock climb. However, I'm not a professional rock climber. Why don't you hire some for that? But <laughs> as far as all like, the martial arts and like parkour type things and athletic and weird body like I had to get out of handcuffs a couple of times and I, I you know worked with the coordinator and was like here I can do this I can do that and it kind of like all worked out to where it made her look really cool and little camera trickery <laughs> here and there but like for the most part it was a perfect match it was like my dream job so, that's amazing yeah and if you're listening yeah. and you haven't checked out that show yet even though it's five seasons go ahead and start that this weekend because it's like it's really a good show like like my husband and I like we started watching it right when it started. I remember like when it came mm-hmm. out, we're like, yeah, we'll, we'll give this one a shot. And then we were still watching it. Like there's very few shows that we like, make sure we like watch it every week. And that's, it's a really good one. So you guys have done an amazing job with it. Yeah, te- definitely a team effort. That's for sure. Everyone really works really hard on it. Worked I love really it. it. And kind of, um, kind of random question off of that, Heidi, but like whenever, because you do have such an active job and literally are active all the time, how much do you feel like it's affected like your creativity, like at times where you're maybe not as active? Mm -hmm. Like, do you notice that it affects your creativity? Because I know, obviously, you love acting, you love writing, you know, you just directed your first film, which congratulations, that's incredible. But like, have you noticed that movement affects your creativity on just a crazy level? Or have you have you noticed anything like that at all? I've actually noticed that being more uh, physical and active and coming up with or c- coming even from an acting side of, of things, um, you do is a different type of creativity. It's coming from an organic place physically. And when so for for all like the fight scenes you see that we do, it's called like a previsual. So we'll kind of put together the action sequences and film them as just the physical stunt portion of it but we have you know the characters and we don't say like the lines or anything but you can like have it all planned out and do actually film it how we think would look best for camera um going through different angles and things and then edit it together so that when we get to set the director has an idea of what shots we need on the day meaning like when we shoot it so it saves everyone a lot of time they could give us notes in the meantime we can kind of change our visions so while they're shooting all like the scenes like the acting scenes that don't have a lot of actions will be um doing our thing and videoing and doing all that kind of stuff. So that being said, we're able to have more of a kind of creative outlet as far as pick and envisioning how the action would play out. So it's kind of using a different part of me specifically in my brain. Like there are people that film it that are stunt people and edit it and you become part of that process. Very intimate, like very intimate process. There's like four of us. So it's the performer is one guy with a camera and our stunt or fight coordinator. And, uh, you know, we're putting it all together as if we're shooting it. So you kind of get in on that, you know, creative side of things or like adding found objects to things and creating fight scenes. And it's kind of a different type of creative thing. But also when I go home at night, sometimes I'll have ideas for things and I'll just shoot, you know, write down some ideas and I'll maybe shoot them and edit them together. And I, you know, I've really found that because I've been doing stunts for so long, it means going on like 14 years now, um, in the business and, and working with this kind of stuff that I know more than I realized I knew. And when I decided to kind of add to my skill set, like directing or coordinating, 
that I was like, oh, I'm going to make a movie. I think you alluded to the fact that I, I wrote, did write and direct and produce feature in six days on the weekends while I was shooting full time on Blind Spot, which was super fun. That's um, awesome. And that's like when we were trying to first start to record this. Oh, and right, then we're right, just right, like, right. <laughs> that's when we first started the talking process. Then we're like, yeah, you're too busy right now. We can't. We can't. I try. That's the thing. I just try to do too much. But that's the that kind of like goes along the lines of like you're trying to tell like a turtle to become a rabbit if you're if you're yeah trying so hard to become skinny and trying to do this thing so hard when like right in front of you is like an open path. Like why don't you see what's down that road, you know? And so once I started opening myself up to these yeah. other opportunities that I really did enjoy, I, I forgot that I came from a place where I used to want to direct and, and all that kind of stuff. And it, you know, with stunts, it's great too, because we're able to, I learned so much about how to shoot action, which is amazing. And it translates not necessarily just action as in like stunts and falling down, but action as in movement and how to use cameras and that medium. And I think that's just working in film and television, I've done like a blind spot there, you know, there are a hundred episodes of blind spot, but I've worked on like a ton of other shows, like, I don't know, Gotham and watching how they work and things that are more stylized and Miss Maisel and um, just kind of like watching the directors and get making friends with the whole crew is um, I'm, I'm, I'm a fairly friendly individual and uh, <laughs> but also quiet and I'll stay in my lane and I'll let people kind of do what they do. And it's been super helpful in unknowingly super helpful in my career and to like when I did my own film, I had people lending me equipment and like they're like here whatever else you need i'm like dude this, why are you doing this and like you know we like you so <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean helpful. you've gathered so much knowledge and so many connections like it's it's yeah. almost like it's perfectly built up to you like now you can direct something now you have yeah, the like, knowledge to put a team together and like know how these open. different moving parts or like we were talking about beforehand like we started recording just how like crazy complex it is because there's so many different things going on at one time um but you've really like been able to learn all of that through this whole process, which is really cool. Yeah, making those, not even realizing it too, like having all these people reach out to to help me make this movie. And I mean, we could do a whole other podcast on this <laughs> movie, but we're gonna, it's quite me, Heidi, Heidi and I are going to have this uh, whole series. It's going to be 30 episodes. And, uh, but no, I also wanted to talk to you, um, you know, what you have planned for the future. I know, like like I said, you just um, co-wrote and directed the film we talked about beforehand, like you, that you're in post mm -hmm. with that and, you know, the awesome stuff that you've done with uh, World Beyond. So like, is there more stuff in the future coming that you, people can be keeping an eye out for? Uh, yeah, for sure. I mean, World Beyond is cool. I, I went down there initially. Uh, they hire stunt performers as their kills for like the zombie things, like the, the empties they're called on it. Um, I'm trying to only like use language that they've already used and like and released in this thing. but um. Yeah, it's just like a handful of stunt people that, you know, get to be all these like zombies. And I got to be a couple of zombies and got killed a awesome. few times. So it's pretty cool. <laughs> but then like, you know, when uh, when they're, I got to go down there to double, that was, I think that's going to be really cool. I'm, I'm, I'm really excited to see this because I'm, I don't want to say like, I'm not a Walking Dead fan, just never followed it from the beginning. So before going on as a zombie, as a, you know, working on the show at all, I went back and I watched a little bit of the first season beginning and then i watched the end of the first season or end of the of the first series like the whole walking dead series to kind of see how it evolved and then a little bit of fear fear of the walking dead um just to kind of get an idea i didn't want to walk in there blind and, and not really know anything about like anything i work on at all i try to do some sort of research like even on your podcast i went and made <laughs> a couple uh, a bunch of them actually um, i appreciate that i started seeing a theme of veganism i'm like oh crap I mean, I have some <laughs> stuff because I've done it. But we I'm, welcome all. I hope she <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, we're all beyond. And then um, I'm working on, I think it's kind of out there. It's a show called Merritt Easton. That's, they're, they're shooting in uh, Westchester currently in Pennsylvania. Um, I, I'm pretty sure it's like on the internet. So I can say that like it exists. It's called Merritt Easton with Kate Winslet. Nice. Uh, it's an HBO show. Uh, that's going to be, she's just the most, like between her and Jamie, I've been blessed with. Um, she looks, at, you know what? <laughs> Titanic was actually on TV last night and I just no forgot way. how much I love them. Yeah. It was, I couldn't commit to the full three and a half hours, but yeah. I committed to quite a bit, but no, she, <laughs> she seems awesome. Oh, I mean, come on though. There was so much room on that door. Like you couldn't put them on the door. Okay. <laughs> Did you ask her? No. <laughs> no. Oh my God. Are you kidding me? Um, no, but, um, <laughs> she's just everything you could 
Jean of and more. She's just wonderful. Is there a lot of film production in Pennsylvania? Because I um, it seems to be <laughs> building. Like they're building more in Pittsburgh. Yeah. They're building more. I got yeah, that's gonna be freaking awesome. I can't wait to see that movie. The uh, happiest season, Cleo Duvall directed. It's gonna be awesome. Um, I got to work on that. And what other that TV show Bulls coming back? I worked a couple of days on that. I've been just like bouncing around, man, doing lots of things. But yeah, you know, going to work on this thing with Kay has been awesome. That's really cool. So no, I'm coming out. I'm excited to keep up with everything that you put out there. Yeah, I haven't. I'll be honest. I, I've never been um, a Walking Dead watcher i might have to commit you know when there's shows with a lot of seasons you're like i don't know if i want to commit or not but it's probably i probably would really like it um i need to yeah i'll, probably just, I'll watch I'll, I'll try to find you this looks kind of like it looked like i don't think you necessarily had to have watched all the other ones like you get the idea like the world like it's an apocalypse and they found people that are still alive and then they start their journey so it's like it's cool that you can just kind of jump in i think to this world like this new uh, spin off this uh, world beyond kind of this world beyond season. So I don't know. We'll see because I'm gonna watch it and see if I can follow. <laughs> I'm pretty. I'm pretty sure I'll be all right. So. Yeah. No, that's amazing. Like I, I can't wait to keep up with just everything that you do put out there in all your future projects. But um, Heidi, what is the best way for people to follow you on social media? That way they can keep up with any time that you are in a show or in a film or whenever you uh you release your film. Like, what's the best way they can follow you on social media? Uh, I'm mean, at Stunt Girl Heidi on all of the social things. Um, there, I have a Facebook page. It's just Heidi Jermaine Schnappoff. And then uh, Instagram and Twitter at Stunt Girl Heidi. And uh, I have a website. That's theotherheidi.com. <laughs> yeah, funny story with that too. <laughs> there are a couple of stunt girls named Heidi. And they're like, Heidi Pasco? No. Heidi Moneymaker? No. The other Heidi. That's amazing. No, I'll, I'll definitely put all of those links in the show notes as long as with the uh, the resources that you spoke about. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to find those. Click and check that out. Um, yeah, and then Heidi, just the final question that I ask every guest. But if you just had one piece of advice for the audience, maybe it's been something that's been your biggest takeaway through your whole either wellness journey or professional journey. But you know, if you just had one piece of advice that's helped you personally, what would it be? To follow your own path and to know that your dreams can change that's definitely both physical wellness career anything wise to allow your path to change to have your dreams and allow them to change and follow suit as they do awesome that's perfect I know, that's Heidi. too vague but <laughs> no no i love it definitely it's perfect my, my motto i love it no heidi you're amazing and thank you so much again for taking the time to come on here i know you're busy so i really appreciate it and just guys go give Heidi, a follow, keep up with all of her projects, support her films coming up. And just Heidi, thank you so much again. I really appreciate it. Thanks. Thanks so much for reaching out. Appreciate it so much. Thank you guys so much for listening to today's episode. I hope you loved my conversation with Heidi. She's doing so much amazing work. So be sure to give her a follow on social media to keep up with everything that she's been working on. You can also find her social media links that we talked about in the episode in the show notes, but you can also find them on my website as well at drcaseyjohnson.com. That's D-R-K-A-S-E-Y-J-O-H-N-S-O-N.com. Click on the Listen tab. Then from there, you'll be able to see all of the past guests that have come on the Unlock Wellness podcast, read a little bit about each guest, and be able to click on their social media links, websites, all of that. So all of Heidi's information can be found on my site as well. If you guys love today's episode with Heidi, be sure to jump onto iTunes, subscribe, and write a review. It really helps me out a lot, and I really appreciate all of the feedback and support. Thank you guys so much again for tuning into today's episode. I hope you loved it. I hope it inspires you. And most importantly, I hope you take action.